Welcome to Interact Reverse Engineering Edition 2. Now in this video, we'll be walking through one of my very early experiments in Unreal Engine 4, which has been remastered to Unreal Engine 5, as this was requested by one of the subscribers. Now the important parts of the code that I'm going to explain are going to be the main logic, which is using overlap volumes to trigger physics, as well as the enhanced input system. So this will actually be one of my first videos using the enhanced input system as it, I've never taught it before. So if you've been struggling a little bit on how to use it, uh, this will be a great video for you. Now, of course, if you're already a Patreon member, you can access this project file to follow along. Otherwise, it is available for purchase. Now on the surface, it is a very simple chain of executions, very simple logic, I would say in my opinion, maybe not for you if you're just starting. So I would say this is mostly somewhere between beginner to intermediate. Uh, and so be aware of that. First of all, why don't we begin with the enhanced input system? Of course, this was initially created using UE4. And so it was using the old deprecated system and I had to upgrade it into the enhanced input system. And so the difference is that you no longer do it here, but actually you go in and create input assets, and then you load it in, in the blueprints. And that's how it works. And so basically I would recommend you to create a new folder and you want to create this here, which is right click and input, input action asset for every single input that you want. And in this case, we have six buttons and two uh, float inputs, which are going to be the left thumbstick uh, X and Y axis. So why don't we just take a look, double click this one and this one, because you can see the button is a digital. So a Boolean, true or false, one or zero. And then for this one, you can definitely configure it using Access 2D for the thumbstick, but I decided to keep it separate. And so when you create it, it will usually come here at, like this as default. And so you gotta just change it to the type of input that you want. And that's basically it. You don't have to do anything else with this particular asset. So we can just close it out. And then let's go into this, which is the, what is it called? The input mapping context. And so this, if we click, is a lot more similar to what we had before. Okay, so now that you have these input action assets created, you need to add them into the mapping context. And it's quite simple. You just add here and it gives you your list of everything that you have. You select it, which I've already done. And after that, you go in into here and add a control binding. And that gives you basically the list here, very similar. And so it's quite similar to this one where you go in here and you select. And if you need to negate a key, you just do minus one. But I would say this is the different thing about the enhanced input system. So of course, with this one, the W and S keys, W is fine, it's positive, but the S needs to be negated. So what you do is you go into modifiers and you add in a new element and you select negate. And so when you press S, it'll be negative one. And there are other cool things in here that allows you to modify the input. I've added in smooth because I would say the keyboard input is quite a, you know, a notched, very binary input. So smoothing is nice. And that's what I've done. And as you can see, that's basically the whole input. We have the thumbstick X axis, the Y axis, and then the six buttons. So this particular interactive art uses the left shoulder, right shoulder, face buttons here, as well as, uh, you know, your laptop keyboard, you can use that as well. One, two, three, four, five, and six, as well as the W ASD keys. And that's basically the mapping part. And next up, we're going to be looking at how you use this in blueprints. Now that the assets for the inputs are created, we need to implement it into the blueprints. And so for this piece, I'm using it in the BP frame. So just go ahead and open it. And the very first step you need to do is you basically need to link it or add in this into this blueprint. And the workflow is like this. You get your player controller, you search for this particular node, and people suggest that you want to add in a is valid when you start running, the context might not be loaded. 
okay? And so after it's valid, you want to search for this particular node. And in this dropdown, you will get your input mapping context asset. And that's basically it. And after you do that and compile, you'll be able to search for your inputs. So if you search for the name of your input action assets, so for me, it starts with IA and then it's going to be, as you can see here, everything is here. And when you click, I've already have everything here. You'll get this thing. And the difference is that there are different kind of execution ports. But if you want to keep it simple, just get the triggered. This is kind of like the pressed. And then the completed should be the released. Uh, if you're talking about buttons, of course. And so this is where I trigger the different... I call it pump event, but it's like the piston, which we will see later. It's like this. And then for the access values, I'm using it in the event ticks. So you can also get an event of the input as well as get the value of the input. So as you can see here, IA, and if I do R, and so this is the event. So this is the red one, and you can also get the values, which is here. And that's basically it. So it's seems a little complex on the surface, but it's actually quite simple. You know, which is normal with Unreal Engine, I have to say. Uh, okay, I have something wrong here. Anyways, that's basically it for the enhanced input system. For the last part of this video, we'll be looking at the other blueprints that contribute to the effect of this interactive art piece. Now, it's actually quite simple. So this explosive movement is actually triggered by, you know, a very fast movement of this piston here, which you can see it goes up and that flicks it out. And then the force that it needs to come back into the center, that is a manual uh, execution that I have here. So you want to go into the BP sphere. As you can see in the event tick, this is where I have the fake gravity. Now I have turned off the, the actual gravity because I don't want it to drop. And so this is basically zero G. And then the force is calculated over here. So Basically, you want to get the directional vector from the origin to the sphere. You normalize that, and so you get the directional vector, and you want to use that to scale it up to apply it to the impulse. All right, so here's a great tip for you. If you're doing any kind of physics in a real-time engine, and so have you ever noticed when your FPS is lower, your forces are weaker, and if it's high FPS, your physics forces are, are way too strong? And if you think about it, it's quite obvious because the event tick interval becomes longer. And so overall, you get less impulse. And then contrarily, if it's higher, you get way too much. And so I think I saw a video where someone was modding a very old game, which was made for 30 and then bumped it up to 120. And, you know, the character loads, lands, it's like a third of the height of their body. And it's registered as like an instant kill because it thought it was like falling way higher than it should be. And so that's basically caused by not having it adapt between different FPS. And to solve this issue, what we do as developers is to use the delta seconds value, which grows and shrinks based on the FPS. And so basically, instead of plugging this scalar directly, you want to times it by the delta seconds and apply it into here. And for the scalar, you need to have it quite large because this value is very small. And this will allow you to more or less keep a similar kind of reactivity on your physics forces across different FPS ranges. It won't be exactly the same, but it will be, uh, you know, more or less about the same. And so this will get around, get you around this problem. Let's continue on more of the core logic of this piece. So we have the BP sphere. What are we going to do with it? Of course, that's going to be dictated by the pistons action so go into here and so with this blueprint it has two volumes first one is used just for spawning so i'm using the random point and bounding box and the spheres will spawn within that bounds and all of the pistons will try to get references to all the spheres in the level which is used here pump event so pump event is triggered when you press a button and when you press the button First, what happens is that it animates the movement of the piston. So it goes up 
and then change its color emission. That's fine. And the secondary thing it's going to do is before it moves, it'll see which spheres were, were overlapping with this volume. And it checks here, hey, any of the, your spheres here in the list overlapping with my volume right now? If it's yes, we trigger the reaction. Now for the reaction, it takes in the location of the piston center as well as its color because the special thing about this is that each piston has a, a specific color. And so if any of the spheres are triggered, on one of the pistons, it will inherit the color of that piston. So triggered here, and we get into the BP sphere, which we will talk about next. All right, now we are in the very last part of the core logic. So when a sphere is triggered, this event is called, and we take the piston center and the next color. So the color is very simple. The piston color is set as the next color, and what you have here is after the timeline, of course, is that it will take its current color and then lerp it into B, which is the next color. And so that's where it inherits the color of the piston and it'll stay that way. And when it comes around the next time, let's just say the next color, it started white, goes to blue. Now blue becomes current, which is done here. Now it's blue and then we're gonna move from blue to let's just say red and so on and so forth. And there are other things here which changes the parameters of the emission. That's great. And what else? Okay, let me explain what this piston center is used for. Basically, it's to differentiate or randomize the, the size of the spheres based on the distance of the sphere to the center of the piston. So let me just make a very bad drawing. So you can see this is the piston. You know, some spheres are going to be like here, here, whatever. Piston center is probably somewhere here. And so it'll have different distances, right? As you can see here. And then based on that distance, we change how much it gets scaled when it gets flinged out. And you'll be able to see when it shrinks down, some of them are bigger and some of them are smaller. And of course, randomization is very important when it comes to uh, any kind of 3D effect. So that's what this is basically doing. And workflow is very similar. So we take the vector, and then you can use this node to calculate the size of the vector, so the length of the vector. And then using that, I have set to like 0 to 18 as distance, and using that to change the size. And that gets applied here. Okay, so that should be it. Yep. And so as you can see, not overly complex. There's some other things in the construction script just to set some initial parameters. Not that important. And so actually, I almost forgot to include this extremely important part which enables this effect to work. And so if you're doing anything intricate where you're using not a physics force, but literally the position or the scale of another mesh to influence the surrounding meshes, um, you know, velocity and position, you need to increase the interval of the physics solver. And so you need to do this because when you open up Unreal for the first time uh, with a black project file, if you go down to physics and you go down here, you will find that substepping is turned off. And actually you can go ahead and try this, turn it off and, and run it and see what happens. What will happen is that there's less intervals so that it doesn't get calculated properly. And so the, the rigid bodies will start to intersect with each other and it just wouldn't work at all. And this is also can happen if your FPS is too low. And actually, if you have your FPS really high and turn off substepping, it might actually work. Uh, but anyways, I turn it on because usually it doesn't work for my FPS range, which, which is like 60 for me for these kind of installations. So again, extremely important for these things to work without it, you, things will just start to intersect. And so that's basically it. If anything wasn't clear in the project file as you're going through it, make sure you leave it in the Patreon member sections of the comments, and I will try to help you as much as possible. And of course, as usual, thank you very much. Make sure you give it a like if you haven't. And if you're not a member yet of the Patreon, visit interact.live to access exclusive project files 
as well as over 10 hours of UE5 learning content for interactive art.